Good afternoon. This is Kyle Welch with RCR Wireless News. Thank you for attending Interference Hunting for Improved Quality of Experience, presented by Rodian and Schwartz. Our presenter today is Paul Denisowski, Application Engineer at Rodian and Schwartz. Just a reminder that within 24 hours of this webinar, we will provide you with a link to the on-demand version of today's webinar. During the webinar, we encourage you to submit questions via the control panel, which will then be answered towards the end of the pr presentation. With that being said, I'd like to turn the presentation over to Paul. Well, thank you very much. Hello, everyone. My name is Paul Denisowski, an, ap an Applications Engineer for Rodian Schwartz, and what I'll be presenting today is Interference Hunting for Improved Quality of Experience. Now, obviously, the first thing I'd like to talk about, I'd like to define quality of experience. Um, quality of experience essentially is defined as the performance of a system as seen or perceived by the end users or customers. Now as RF performance engineers or people involved in RF at a technical level, we tend to think of radio frequency interference and quality of service in terms of statistics. So things like RSSI, signal to noise ratio, bit error rates, we tend to think of quality of service in terms of actual metrics, KPIs that we can measure. Uh, the reality is, however, that users are usually not particularly concerned with these type of metrics. They're interested in things such as voice quality or data throughput. So it's important for us to begin by understanding that users don't necessarily see these parameters or don't perceive them as something that's important. While we may be very concerned with what the noise floor is in a certain part of town, um, this is not something that the users normally see and perceive. Now, there are a number of different parameters that are important that are related to quality of experience. So I'd like to talk about each one of them briefly. One is coverage or service availability. This is essentially where you have coverage or where you're able to use a wireless service. A wireless service could be the best service in the world, but if you're unable to actually use that service, it's really not much of a use to you. Um, there's reliability of the system, system availability. This is how well the system works, especially under adverse conditions. As we go further through the presentation, you'll see that by adverse conditions, what we really are referring mostly to is interference here. And the last one is performance. That is the actual throughput of data, voice quality, and other metrics like that. And all of these tie together to build what the user perceives as quality of experience. Now, what impacts quality of experience? There are basically three main areas that impact how a user sees quality of experience. And these are services and applications, devices, and the network itself. Now, the network is an easy part for most of us to understand. The network is the infrastructure that provides the wireless services. The service providers, these would be, of course, uh, base stations, et cetera. On the device side, these are the user devices. Again, in a cellular networking environment, these would be phones, UEs, user equipment. And then services and application probably deserves a little bit more explanation. These are the applications actually running on the device or on the phone. And there are interactions between all three of these. For example, it's very clear to most people probably on this uh, webinar, the interaction between the device and the network. Does the phone talk to the network? Do they interoperate properly over different vendors, different suppliers? issues that are involved in the communication between those two. That will impact quality of experience. Uh, likewise, there's an interaction between the network and the service and applications. There are some applications that may be very bandwidth intensive or that put special loads on the network, and these have to be considered as well. There's also an, an interaction between the service and applications and the device. And again, this is how well the device runs certain applications or the impact that certain applications have on devices. Uh, battery life would be a good example of this. Where all three of these areas come together is where we define quality of experience. And to give you a practical example of this, uh, Volti, Voice over LTE, is an example of where all three of these components is very important in quality of experience. For example, if you want to have a Volti call, you're going to need a network that can support Volti that can do prioritization if necessary. You need devices that can support it because not all devices are created equal. And you also need services and applications running on the UE, in this case, the Volti application. And these, again, will not be equal. All of these together will contribute into what we consider to be quality of experience. And this is very important for the user. Now, for this presentation and for this webinar, we're going to be concentrating mostly on the per devices and networks. Since, again, as people working in doing interference hunting in an RF environment, this is where we have the most opportunity to find improvements or to combat problems in the network. So why is quality of experience important? I'd like to talk about, again, mostly from a cellular networking uh, point of view, but it can be applied to other ones as well. Why is quality of service important? Quality of service is basically the, or quality of experience, rather, is basically the prime differentiator in commercial networks. Uh, in the days before, for example, LTE, we had different radio access technologies. So uh, 3G, you could have WCDMA, you could have UMTS. What we have now with a lot of people moving towards LTE, or essentially everyone moving towards LTE, 
is that we're essentially using the same radio access technology. So what makes provider A or equipment vendor A better than provider or equipment vendor B? It's going to be quality of experience. Um, these will affect how people make decisions about what's a good and a bad network, whether they're happy with a service, etc. This also applies to non-commercial networks. For example, for government, military, public safety applications, what you'll see is the quality of service is very, or quality of experience is very important here as well. And there are two main factors that go into quality of experience, again, from an RF and interference hunting level, and that's system or device design and resource plannings, as well as the RF environment. And again, our webinar today is going to focus mostly on the RF environment component. So why is interference hunting important for quality of experience? Well, interference affects quality of experience by degrading the RF environment of wireless systems. Uh, a wireless system, obviously, that has to operate in a degraded environment will have a poor quality of experience, normally speaking, than one that has an ideal RF environment. Um, as all of you probably know, spectrum is a very expensive and very limited resource. There's only so much spectrum, and there's a limit to how much information can be pushed over a certain bandwidth with a certain noise flow, with a certain signal to noise ratio. And therefore, it's imperative that we use this spectrum efficiently. Um, resolving interference is generally, I would say always, but I'll say generally here, um, almost always more cost effective than we, if we try to increase performance. Um, there are some cases in which if you have poor coverage or you have interference issues, you overcome by essentially more infrastructure, more towers, bigger antennas, more gain, etc. However, there are many cases in which interference is at such a level or so severe that no amount of infrastructure changes can overcome it. And in this case, there will be a definite negative impact to quality of experience if interference is in fact present. Now, LTE I'd like to talk about because LTE has really raised the bar for interference and the levels of interference that are tolerable. Um, many of you may have worked on older 2 or 3G cellular networks. Um, this also applies to older analog radio networks if you're in a public safety role, for example, and have used analog trunking radios versus something digital like P25. Um, LTE has raised the bar for interference because, first of all, it's become very widely deployed. LTE is being used by network operators, it's being used by military, government, public safety, etc. And it's become a worldwide standard. You have to assume that you can have LTE access for radios all over the world, and it's rapidly becoming that way in, in pretty much every place that you would visit. The downside to LTE is, of course, that it requires a much cleaner RF environment. Um, compared to 2 and 3G technologies that were more robust in the face of interference, LTE has a much lower tolerance, if you will, for interference because, again, LTE, in order to provide the higher speeds, higher data rates, uh, put uh, shorter round trip times, it requires a much cleaner RF environment. So interferers that might have been and not have been an issue for older cellular networks are now a much bigger issue for LTE. In other words, we have interference at levels that might not have bothered us in previous technologies. There are other aspects to LTE that are also important. For example, the use of remote radio heads. In doing interference hunting prior to the use of remote radio heads, one could often go to the E node B, or rather the space station, and plug into the RF sniffer port and actually look at the spectrum as seen by the antennas mounted on the top of a tall tower with gain. Unfortunately, with a remote radio head, which is at the top of the tower and which feeds the uh, rest of the network through a fiber optic cable, we no longer have that access to the RF. We can no longer see the RF that the tower saw. And what this often forces us to do is to drive the area. We can no longer say, what does this look like? We have to actually go out in the field, in the area that's being covered by that cell or by that sector and drive the area. There's also some challenges with regards to the next version of LTE, LTE Advanced, uh, one of the big characteristics of which is carrier aggregation. We're going to see spectrum being used in chunks or blocks that are aggregated together to provide higher throughput. And what this means is that interference issues can affect our overall throughput, even though may, they may be located in different frequency ranges, different aggregated carriers. So what are common sources of interference? Um, one of the things that I enjoy the most about interference hunting is it's the variety of devices that can cause interference. Anyone who's done interference hunting for a long period of time knows that uh, there's almost an endless supply of devices that will cause interference. But there are several common causes of interference that I'd like to mention. Uh, the first one, the most important one, I think, is other wireless services. Uh, the sad truth is that in many cases, it's one wireless service interfering with another. Not usually intentionally, but these kind of things do, in fact, happen. They're basic sort of RF characteristics or phenomena, such as harmonics and intermodulation. These are, are common sources of interference, especially when you have high-powered transmitters or transmitters in close physical proximity. Uh, faulty or misconfigured repeaters and amplifiers. This is the bi-directional amplifier, which has caused many problems in cellular networks, or other types of amplifiers that uh, misbehave or can cause huge increases in the noise floor over many tens of megahertz. 
or it can cause signals that drift or wander over a certain frequency range and therefore can be very difficult to locate or analyze. Serious emissions is any radiation from an electronic device that's non-intentional. Almost all electronics generate some radio frequency signals at certain frequencies. Uh, this would be the classic case of a plasma TV, for example, which generates signals that interfere with a cellular uplink. One of the things that's also come up recently in terms of spurious emissions is lighting ballasts. There's certain fluorescent lighting ballasts, unfortunately, that generate uh, unacceptable levels of RF noise at frequencies used by many network providers. One uh, very interesting and I think perhaps underestimated source of egress or, or source of interference has been cable leakage or egress. Uh, cable television systems, as you probably know, use the same frequencies that cellular providers use for 700 megahertz. And what that's meant is that signals that egress or leak from a, uh, a cable TV system can cause problems to cellular networks. Uh, this is not an issue before because there was very little frequency overlap between the systems and also because, again, the slower and lower order modulation of previous cellular systems was more immune to this type of interference. Um, you can also have unlicensed wrong band operations. Um, it's always amazing to me how many people will transmit on frequencies that don't belong to them. Uh, this does continue to go on. And the last one is jammers or malicious interference. There is, of course, still a of people out there who have jammers or other devices intentionally disrupting communications and these obviously are a pretty severe source of interference because they're intended to interfere. So there are two steps in interference hunting. Uh, the first step in interference hunting is identifying that interference is present at all and then trying to identify what that interference looks like. Um, this is normally done by actually viewing the spectrum itself the next step is, of course, finding the interference. We need to know where the interference is coming from, that is, which direction, which bearing, as we'll talk about, and also what kind of device is generating the interference. Identifying interference is obviously the first step in this. You have to know that interference is happening, that the problem is external, for example, to the system. Um, you, it's helpful to know what the interference looks like, um, but that by itself is not sufficient. In order to successfully hunt and resolve interference, you have to physically find the source. You have to be able to actually put your finger on it and pull the plug, so to speak. It's usually not sufficient to say it's somewhere within this building. You actually have to say it's coming from this particular box. Now the size, the shape, the location, the behavior of the interference can give you strong hints as to its location. As an example here on this slide, you'll see a picture of cable television egress. Uh, cable television egress, as I mentioned in the previous slide, is when cable television signals leak into the uh, over-the-air environment. And the good news is it's very easy to recognize. If you look at this slide, you'll see these six megahertz wide uh, qualm haystacks and they're pretty regularly spaced and you can see that they have, they're always on and they are very, very unique in terms of their spectral pattern. Um, if you were to have an interferer, for example, in your uplink band and you saw this, this would be a huge hint as to what you have to look for because obviously there are a limited number of devices from which cable signals can escape. So if you see that the interferer looks like what you see here on the screenshot, you can limit your interference hunting activities to things like cables, amplifiers, repeaters, pedestals, and not worry so much about LCD billboards, or other such devices. Now I'd like to talk about interference hunting tools. I mean, one of the things that's important about, to understand about RF is it's something that we cannot as human beings normally sense without instruments. So in order to do interference hunting, you will need some kind of instruments that can sense RF and give you information about it. Um, there are several specialized tools that are used in interference hunting. One of them is spectrum analyzers or monitoring receivers. I'll talk about the difference between those in a minute. Uh, directional antennas is an extremely important component in interference hunting. It would be very difficult to do interference hunting without a directional antenna. There's also direction finding systems. These are systems that allow you to locate an interferer by simply giving it the frequency and perhaps some other parameters of the interferer. And knowledge bases. One thing that I think is underestimated in terms of tools or resources for people doing interference hunting is the vast body of knowledge that already exists in terms of interferers, what they look like, where they are, and how to resolve them. Another very important aspect in terms of interference hunting is having a good practical knowledge of certain things. Uh, RF in general is very important, but propagation I think is key. Knowing how signals travel, how they can get into or out of structures or out of enclosures is very important. Um, being aware of what's where in spectrum, the allocations, what kind of signals might you see 800 megahertz, uh, this is very important as well. And also methodologies, as just like all other technologies, as interference hunting has evolved over time, some methodologies that may have worked for older technologies no longer work, and there are continual advancements in the field. As we'll see, there are new methodologies and new tools coming out, and these are things that can be very helpful in resolving interference. Let me talk for a moment about spectrum analyzers versus monitoring receivers. Um, there is a difference between them. It's often very difficult to tell what they are by looking at them. The spectrum analyzer is probably the tool that many of you are familiar with. It's, it's based on the heterodyne or SWEFT architecture, SWEFT principle. 
if you have a device that has a sweep time, then that is a heterodyne-based instrument. Essentially, it sweeps a small window, a resolution bandwidth, if you will, across a, an area of spectrum, and it displays what that spectrum looks like. Uh, this is the traditional way of doing it. It works very well. It makes very precise measurements. Uh, there are some limitations in using spectrum analyzers for doing interference hunting. Uh, generally, they tend to be much slower than a monitoring receiver, and they may have, or rather they may not have, certain features that you may find in a dedicated monitoring receiver. On the other hand, spectrum analyzers also tend to be general purpose pieces of equipment, so they can be applied in a wide range of applications for interference hunting. Now, as interference hunting has grown in importance, you've also seen the development of new tools called monitoring receivers. These are not the traditional heterodyne swept receivers or instruments that you may be used to. These are actually based on an FFT architecture, where they take a block of spectrum, digitize it, do a Fourier transform, and then output the results. This means that they're very, very fast. And as we'll see in a few later slides, speed is very important at in interference hunting for a variety of reasons. And typically, these are single purpose instruments, whereas a spectrum analyzer may be applied for many different tasks. Monitoring receivers tend to be purpose-based and designed for interference hunting and spectral monitoring. I'd like to talk and spend a little bit of time on this slide because I think it's an important slide. It's the importance of speed in interference hunting. Um, I'm often asked by people, why is speed important in interference hunting? And I think there are some misconceptions about this. Obviously, if you're looking for a bursty or intermittent signal, one that's very short duration, very, very quick pulses, then you would need a very fast instrument in order to be able to see that signal. That, however, is typically not a large source of interference in most networks. If a signal is on the only, only on the, the air for, say, 10 milliseconds every really not on the air long enough to be an interference, I mean, interfere. Why then is speed important in interference hunting, especially if we're looking at, for example, a CW, a continuous wave interferer, something that's on the air all the time? In, in this case as well, speed is very important. The reason that speed is important in interference hunting is essentially twofold. One is that the faster an instrument responds to signals, the more quickly you can move past that signal and not miss it. And let me give an example of what I mean by this. Uh, the example of LTE. the lower layer and lower level interferes, which means we can't see it very well. We may not have access to the actual antenna system to be able to see it the way the tower sees it. So we're essentially forced to drive the area. Now, if this is a low level interfere and we're driving the area at a reasonable speed, uh, uh, a speed, say, 30, 40, 50 miles an hour, and we pass by it, a slower instrument may not be able to see that interfere at all. So this would require us to either, A, redrive the area in hopes that we hit it the next time, or drive much more slowly, perhaps at an unnaturally slow rate in the hopes that we'll pass by the interferer. The other way that speed is important in interference hunting is the, so what I will call the last 100 yards dilemma. Usually what will happen is you will be able to get down to an area of maybe 100 yards or so, and then have to manually sweep the area with a handheld antenna. Again, if the instrument responds quickly, then you'll get an indication from the instrument, say for example, an audible tone, or you'll see a change in level on the display, as soon as that antenna is pointed at the device that's generating the interference. On the other hand, with a slower instrument, you'll have trouble doing this because you'll have to move the antenna much more slowly. And as anyone who's done interference hunting knows, time is essentially money in interference hunting as well. You need to be able to resolve the interferer as quickly as possible. Now, I'd like to talk about directional antennas. I've had people ask me if it's possible to do interference hunting without a directional antenna, and my answer, quite frankly, is no. Um, it's really a very, very important component of interference hunting. Uh, there are two general types of antennas that are used, handheld antennas, that are used in interference hunting. Uh, Yagi's and what I'm going to call generically wideband antennas. Uh, Yagi antenna, there's a picture here on this slide, they generally have very good directionality. They have a very tight beam width. If you, you point it towards the source of an interference, you get a much stronger response than if it's pointed away. And the gain is relative to the number of elements that it has in it. And these antennas work very well. They tend to be very low cost and again, good directionality and good gain. But that comes, as everything does, with a cost. Uh, essentially, most Yagi antennas are what I like to refer to as deaf outside of their specified frequency range. So a Yagi antenna that's tuned, for example, for 850 megahertz may work reasonably well at 800 and 900 megahertz, but probably doesn't work very well at all at 700 or a gig and is almost completely deaf when you get to, say, 400 megahertz. This is the drawback of using band-matched antennas, that if you're in the band of operation, they work very, very well. Once you get outside of that band, they work less well. Why is this important? Well, interference issues are often multi-band. For example, harmonics. A harmonic, of course, is a whole number multiple in frequency of a certain fundamental signal. I may see an interfere at, say, 800 megahertz. That's actually the fourth harmonic of a signal at 200 megahertz. And, of course, the 200 megahertz signal will be stronger 
and it will be easier to do direction finding you're locating on because it's higher amplitude. If I have an antenna that's only tuned for 800 and I try to look for something at 200, that's problematic because I have the quote unquote wrong antenna. Likewise, you'll see some amplifiers, bidirectional amplifiers used in cellular systems often may be multi-band. So you may have an amplifier that's causing wide raises at both 850 and 1900. Spurious emissions also can occur at a wide range of frequencies and there are wideband noise sources. Uh, jammers are an excellent example of a very wideband noise source that may extend over several hundred megahertz. Another aspect is spectral refarming. Uh, 700 megahertz exists because UHF TV channels were vacated from that frequency range and we're going to see more of this as time goes on. This means that you have to be prepared as an interference hunter to look at various frequencies, different frequency bands, possibly separated by many tens or hundreds of megahertz. Antenna per band at that point becomes cumbersome and problematic. If you have to support seven or eight bands, it's really not practical to bring with you seven or eight Yagi antennas in the field. Now, there are antennas that are wideband antennas. Uh, there's a picture of one here. These often work on different physical designs, for example, a long periodic versus a Yagi antenna. The wideband or multiband antennas allow operation generally over a much wider frequency range. Now, again, there is a drawback to a wider frequency range in that their beam width tends to be wider. They're not as laser focused as a Yagi antenna might be. But again, the trade-off is that it requires you to only bring one antenna with you instead of five, six. The situation will determine which antenna combination is, is most appropriate for a, a given task. Now, with regards to direction finding, there's two major steps in radio location or direction finding, what I will call the geographic part and the local part. The geographic part is where you essentially drive around typically and try to get within, let's say, 100 yards, maybe 50 yards of the interfering source. So you want to have a general idea. It's coming from this building. It's coming from this set of apartments. It's coming from this set of utility poles. And then there's the local part where you actually have to go and figure out exactly what point, down to the inch, down to the device, that's generating the interference. And these require different approaches. Typically for usually in the geographic approach, you drive an area looking for issues and you'll take bearings. You'll say, I think the interferer is that way or this way. It has a bearing. It has a, a, a direction that it's located in. And these bearings or directions can be determined, as we'll see, manually or in an automated method. Then there's the local part, where you actually walk the area holding a handheld directional antenna and sweep the area, looking for the device or the point at which you see the maximum level of the interferer, and hopefully that's the uh, device that you're looking for. Now there's two methods of getting bearings. I mentioned before that the geographic part involves taking bearings. There's two methods of doing this. One is the manual method, and one is the automatic method. So in the manual method of taking bearing, essentially the operator, you, are holding a directional antenna, maybe this is a Yagi, maybe this is a wideband, depending on what you're doing, and you move the antenna around until you get the maximum signal level. That's typically the way that it's done. A bearing will, in this way, will then be plotted or saved and used in triangulation. There's also an automatic method of getting bearings where you have an instrument, a system, that you input a frequency and it automatically, based on characteristics of the incoming signal, it automatically computes the bearing line and then plots a line towards where the source of the signal, or plots a line towards the source of the signal. And I'll talk a little bit more about these in the next few slides. Now a bearing by itself, a single bearing is useful in the sense that it points you in the right direction, but it also has a limitation that it only tells you the direction. It doesn't tell you how far away the interferer is. I'm guessing many people on this call have had the experience that they do interference hunting, of knowing that the interferer is in a certain direction and driving and driving and driving and driving and finding out that it's 10 or 15 miles away. Um, this is what we would like to avoid. And one way that we can avoid this is by taking multiple bearings. Ideally, what you would do in this bearing-based method of direction finding, of geographic direction finding, is you go to a location and take a bearing. You say that the transmitter is in this certain direction. Then you go to some other location. Uh, ideally, you'd like to try to get around where you think the interferer is and take another bearing. And you continue to take a certain number of bearings and hope that these cross in one location. And this would be triangulation. Uh, typically, you need at least two or three lines to do triangulation. Uh, more is better up to a certain point. But there are some limitations on the triangulation approach in terms of taking bearings. First of all, the quality of your triangulation, the point that's calculated to be the likely source of the emitter, um, that point's accuracy is going to be based on the accuracy of the bearings that you take. If you take very good bearings, you should have a very good triangulation point. Less accurate bearings, a less accurate triangulation point. And again, one way that you can overcome this is by taking a large number of bearings and discarding what I will call flyers, bearings that obviously make no sense at all. Sometimes you'll get in a position, you'll take a bearing, and it's pointing completely in the opposite direction from all the other bearings. And this is where a certain amount of experience and, and human intelligence is required. 
things would work very well and would, would lead us to a large number of interfering sources with one exception, and that's the problem with multipath. Multipath, as the name implies, is where a signal takes multiple paths to get from transmitter to receiver. Um, for example, many of you may have sat in traffic at a tra traffic light listening, listening to an FM radio station that sounds a little bit not so good, and you move the car, inch it forward a few inches, and it clears up. Why? It's multipath. You've moved far enough that you've canceled out the effect of receiving this radio signal from multiple directions with slightly different time delays. Now, multipath is a fairly substantial issue for interference hunting in urban areas because in urban areas where you have lots of buildings or other structures which will reflect radio frequency signals, you'll receive the signal from multiple directions, and therefore it's very difficult to know which direction the transmitter is actually located in. Um, multipath is a problem for both manual and automatic bearing-based direction finding. Uh, the good news is, of course, that multipath, although it makes your life much more difficult in terms of direction finding, doesn't really impact your ability to do analysis of signals. If you want to know what does the interference look like, what is the level of the interference, uh, what are the particular spectral characteristics, the bandwidth of the interference, multipath will not affect this at all. But for direction finding, this can vastly complicate our lives, and that's why it's imperative that we find ways to deal with multipath. So if we're doing fixed location bearings, and by fixed location bearings, I mean, for example, standing in a location and moving our antenna, or putting a system in a certain location and having it getting bearings. In these fixed location bearings, how do we minimize the effects of multipath? The best way to do this is by carefully choosing your bearing locations. You don't want to choose a location to take a bearing that's, say, between two tractor trailers, because I can tell you exactly where your bearing will come from. It will come from the gap between the two tractor trailers. What you want is locations that minimize the effects of multipath. And in urban or semi-urban environments, these locations are typically away from obstructions, obstructions being buildings, vehicles, et cetera. They're away from metallic structures, again, vehicles. I don't underestimate the ability of vehicles or other metallic structures to reflect radio frequency energy. Um, another very common metallic structure that most people don't see as metallic are tinted windows, which are tinted by having very small fragments of metal embedded in them. So these act, as, again, as giant pieces of metal from a radio. And generally speaking, higher is always better. If you're in an urban area, getting on the roof is an, is an excellent solution if you're trying to take bearings. Uh, you may or may not have access to the roofs of the buildings that you want to be on. Uh, parking garages are an excellent way to do this as well. Um, unfortunately, despite all this, in many cases, you may not have access to a good bearing location. Uh, you may not have access to rooftops or buildings. The geography of the area may be prohibitive. So it's not always possible to overcome these challenges when you're doing fixed bearings. So one solution that people have is to do vehicle-based bearings. They will drive around and take bearings while in motion. And I, we teach an interference hunting class at Rodian Schwartz, and one piece of advice I give my students is don't drive around and stick the antenna out the window and try to get a decent bearing. And, of course, I do that myself and everyone else does that because, frankly, there's not much of a better solution when you're trying to do vehicle-based bearings with a handheld antenna. Uh, driving around with a Yagi or other antenna on top of the roof, as in this picture, or pointed out of the window is, is really not a great solution. Um, one of the problems that you have is these antennas are, of course, highly directional. So if I'm driving down the street and pointing my antenna out of the passenger side and the interferer is actually on the driver's side, I'm going to run into some issues because the null make it unable for me to see the interferer even though I may have driven almost directly past it. There are also safety issues. Um, it's generally not a good idea to be trying to drive and hold a directional antenna out of the window and manipulate an instrument and look at it all at the same time. So again, not an optimal solution in many cases. And as I mentioned before, vehicles are one of the things that can reflect radio signals. They will attenuate radio signals. So in vehicle-based bearings, when you're driving around with that directional antenna, you often have to stop, exit, move away from the vehicle, because again, the vehicle will act as a large reflector of radio frequency energy to get an accurate bearing, and now you're back to the same fixed bearing location issue you have before. So what do we do about all this? There are a number of ways that we can overcome multipath and multipath-based bearing issues. One methodology that we've already kind of alluded to in a manual method is to take lots of bearings. If I go to many good or reasonably good bearing locations, and I take bearings to try to locate the source of the interference, then I some kind of rough triangulation. The problem is that in many environments, for example, in urban areas, you may not be able to almost from any locations. So you may have the vast majority of your bearings being flyers. Also, because if we do this with a manual bearing methodology, where we're actually moving the antenna and looking at our instrument or listening to a tone, in order to figure out the source of the signal, we introduce a certain amount of human error, and this is a problem as well. Now, what we can do is we can use an automatic direction finding system, preferably one that's relatively immune to multipath, 
and take very large number of bearings. I don't know anyone who does interference hunting who would take three or four thousand bearings on a certain transmitter. That's impractical for a number of reasons. But this is not a problem for a automated system to take many, many bearings. Keep in mind that example of sitting at a stoplight and creeping the car forward to get better FM radio reception, that every time we move, even a very small distance, we change the multipath parameters, we change the multipath profile, if you will, so that we actually get a different set of multipath parameters, different impairments at every different location that we're at. If we could somehow take very large numbers of bearings and then put them through a mathematical algorithm, we could subtract out to a large extent the effect of multipath. This again, a map would get very cluttered with three or four thousand bearings on it at a time. So often the way that systems like this work are by plowing what I, what I would call for want of a better word, probability clouds. So we can anticipate statistically and based on probability and mathematical algorithms, the probable location of the emitter. And then assuming we have enough data and we have enough confidence in that data, such a system would also allow us to locate the transmitter. Again, by taking extremely large, and by extremely large I mean on the order of thousands and tens of thousands of bearings, unique bearings, and then run those through an algorithm in real time and plot the result. Now, excuse me, how would we implement this type of system? Well, to ensure that we have a large number of unique bearings, as I mentioned before, you need to do something where the vehicle or the system is in motion. It makes no sense at all to sit in one location and take 3,000 identical bearings. So any kind of system that would do this, again, the same way that a human would do it with a handheld antenna by picking different locations is by moving around. If you move to different locations, each bearing you have will have different multipath characteristics, and therefore you'll be able to locate a transmitter more reliably because you have a larger body of data. Again, to take bearings in an automatic versus a manual method, you need some kind of antenna or methodology that can look at the incoming signal and make a determination of its bearing based solely on the characteristics of the incoming signal. Now, there are different radio finding methodologies that do this. One, for example, would be correlative interferometry. That's a system in which the phase of the incoming signal is compared to different antennas. There are other systems you may have heard of, Doppler systems, etc. But generally, correlative interferometry has been used in most uh, attempts to overcome multipath simply because of the large number of antennas that are in an interferometer will tend to cancel out some multipath issues. And this allows for a smaller, more portable factor. While there are systems, for example, that use these methodologies, um, these systems can become prohibitively large, physically too large to mount on a vehicle. So again, there's a bit of a compromise involved in terms of trying to have a system that's small enough to be practical, but also still has adequate results. And what's really important, I think, especially with regards to LTE, if you go back to the slide where I originally mentioned the different types of interferers, we don't really know what kind of interferers we'll be dealing with. For example, we may have narrowband interferers and interferers. We may have interferers that are noise-like, for example, jammers or oscillating amplifiers. Uh, we may have interferers that are constant signals. We may have interferers that are bursty or intermittent signals. So ideally, we would need a system that's able to deal with all of these different types of signals, uh, calculate the same parameters based on any type of signal, and then yield results. Now, one thing that I think is continually underestimated in terms of interference hunting is the importance of knowledge bases and knowledge sharing. And I'd like to explain what I mean by that. One of the things that we've seen over and over again is that interference problems tend to reoccur. You tend to see, if you've done interference hunting for a number of years, the same kinds of things happen again and again. I've been asked sometimes when I'm out in the field, how do you know that it's this? And I tell them, well, I've seen it before. Um, that works great if you have seen it before. It's not so good if it's your first time seeing it. So one of the things that I highly encourage uh, all of the people that I work with and anyone involved in interference hunting is to share knowledge, to develop knowledge bases. Interference hunting knowledge is not something that's necessarily confined, confined to a certain organization or to a certain market segment. As an excellent is cable egress. Um, again, previously cable systems and wireless communication systems did not have significant overlap in terms of frequency, and so these groups never had to work with each other. Now that you have issues with cable egress, you have a need to share information about what kind of devices cause leakage? What does this leakage look like? What are acceptable and not acceptable? Not simply between companies doing the same kinds of things, but between different companies. Uh, documentation is very critical in the terms of resolving interference. If you have known interference sources, for example, if you have pictures or screenshots, I often have customers of mine send me pictures and say, do you know what this is? Um, this can be very helpful to have a reference library of them. 
One thing that's often useful in interference hunting is audio demodulation, being able to actually listen to signals that may be audio demodulated. Because again, after a while, you tend to hear the same types of signals and go, oh, I know what that is. I've seen or heard this before. One other thing that's important, especially in our rapidly changing wireless environment, is the need to have a knowledge of what should be in a certain frequency range. I've had many issues I've seen, for example, at 1800 megahertz that were harmonics of devices that were down at 900 megahertz in the ISM band. So knowing what frequencies normally have what kind of signals and also knowing the harmonics, very quick, being able to very quickly do the math and figure out what are harmonics of a signal is often a very useful tool in troubleshooting interference issues. And again, you really want this information to be accessible where, wherever and whenever you are. Uh, the running back to the office to look something else is usually not an optimal way of doing things. So ideally what you would want to do is have some way of carrying this information in the field with you. And if there's anything I can recommend is that set up some system for sharing information about interference between different groups or individuals because I guarantee that it's the rare issue that only comes up one time. I'd like to give an example here just briefly of how this knowledge base will be useful. On the previous slide I showed a screenshot of a bidirectional amplifier. This is from our interference hunting app that we have for mobile phones that is a reference app. And I was recently, I probably shouldn't say where I was, but I was recently in a location where I saw the screenshot that you see here on the left, a very broad noise-like signal. It's about 35 megahertz wide and it's neg 77 dBm, which is horrific. And I looked at the signal with the customer that I was with and I said, that's a BDA. And they said, how do you know? And of course I told them, well, I've seen it before. And at this point I pulled out my screenshots and I said, see, doesn't it look exactly like this? And he looked at it and agreed that it was. Now why is this useful? Well, it's useful because if you know something about bidirectional amplifiers or done with this or been sharing your knowledge properly, you know that typically these systems involve two antennas, a donor antenna on the outside of the building and another antenna on the inside. So the signal is picked up, amplified, and then put into the building and then vice versa. Well, once I saw the screenshot, I knew immediately what I was looking for. Most likely I was looking for a small Yagi mounted on the corner of a building and pointed at the nearest base station. And as you can see from the picture here on the right, that's exactly what we found. So having this knowledge base, being able to look at spectrum or be able to compare spectrum to known issues can give you a huge hint as to what you're looking for and greatly accelerate your interference hunting activities. So in summary, what I'd like to mention again or to reiterate is that rapid detection, location, and resolution of interference issues is a critical component in delivering quality of experience. Again, customers don't know and typically don't care about things like RSSI or signal to noise or noise floor or things like that. What they're interested in is how does their phone work? How does their radio work? How does their data communication system work? And wireless used to be, if you went back maybe 10, 20 years, a nice to have, it's wireless has now become a must have in many cases. So any disruption to a wireless system, any degradation of a wireless system isn't merely irritating. It can be essentially is interfering with a mission critical application. Likewise, as we see, especially in LTE is a prime example of this, the types of interference that we're seeing and the levels of, it, of interfering signals that actually cause problems is changing. LTE again has been raising the bar on interference and this means that we typically need faster instruments, we need different types of systems, and we also need new methodologies in order to keep pace with these and be able to deliver the quality of experience that customers or users expect from the system. And again, the last point again, which I really can't stress enough, is that the ability to share and leverage interference hunting experience is absolutely critical. We'll usually, there are people within your organization or across organizations who have seen what you've seen before, know what kind of devices generate it, know how to resolve it. So I could give you a huge list of times in that I've been out interference hunting, seen a signal, said, hey, I wonder if someone else has seen this, run it by my colleagues and have them say, yes, you're looking for an XYZ brand device and it greatly simplifies and greatly um, improves the efficiency of any interference hunting activity that you're involved on. So that brings us to the end of the slide presentation. Um, if you have questions or comments, you'll see my contact information below. And I believe at this point, we're going to turn it open to questions. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, we, we've had a few questions come in during the webinar. And once again, we do encourage you to submit those questions. You can submit them right here and we'll try and get to them today and any others you, we can follow up after the webinar. Uh, the first question that we had come in today was, um, what will be the impact of small cells on the nature of interference hunting? Uh, that's a really good question. Small cells, of course, is where we try to actually reduce the size of cells. These may be femto cells these, that you install in your house. They may be smaller size cells that are used indoors. The basic fundamentals of interference hunting remain unchanged. You'll still need to use the same tools and methodologies for small cells as you, you would use for 
larger macro cells. Uh, my personal feeling from what I've seen so far with small cells is that, of course, the smaller cells, as they're more distributed, brings up the possibility of having more localized sources of interference. A very weak interfere that might not affect a macro-sized cell, a normal-sized cell, uh, if it's in close proximity to a small cell, will obviously cause greater interference issues. Uh, there are other issues, of course, involved in terms of dimensioning and network planning. But in terms of sheer interference hunting, small cells, the approach for doing interference hunting is really not that much different for large cells. Great. Uh, one other question we had are, is, what are the major sources of interference impacting LE, LTE today? And what about with LTE advanced? How does that differ? Uh, well, LTE, I'll, I'll take the second part first. LTE advanced and LTE are essentially the same thing in, in many regards. From an interview interference hunting point of view, LT advanced, the main thing that you'll see differently is carrier aggregation. The downlink signals, et cetera, and the uplink signals are essentially the same. Carrier release 10 feature in LTE. And what this really means is that you will have uh, different bandwidth segments, different uh, carriers being bonded together, being aggregated together. And therefore, if you have an overall drop in throughput or system performance, it could be due to interferes at any one of those component carriers that make up your carrier aggregated LTE. Now, in terms of the major interference sources for LTE, from my own experience uh, doing field work, I would say the major interferes, it depends on the frequency band. Most of the LTE in the United States is currently at 700 that you'll see at 700 megahertz, again, in my experience, have been cable egress, uh, surprisingly so to me, but it's, it's been a very big issue in many places. You also see issues with bidirectional amplifiers, that old. And then there, because 700 megahertz was used for other things before LT was deployed there, there, believe it or not, years later, still are many people using devices in that frequency range that should have left it long ago. Uh, wireless microphones is an excellent example of this. And here's a case where audio demodulation is very important. I tell people if you see a narrow band interfere, always try to demodulate it. Because if it is audio and you are able to listen to it, it gives you an enormous clue as to what the source of the interferer would be. Um, other questions? All right, yep. Uh, one more coming in is, how well do direction finding tools work on wideband interferers? Direction finding tools work, well, there's two kinds of direction finding tools. One, of course, is the manual uh, handheld antenna, the directional antenna. And that, in that case, doesn't really matter too much if it's wideband or narrowband. Now, for automatic direction finding systems, there are various technologies that are used for automatic direction finding systems. Uh, some of the ones that you may be familiar with are, for example, Doppler, uh, Watson Watt, time, uh, TDOA, time difference of arrival, correlative interferometry, etc. These different technologies handle different types of sig signals differently. For example, Doppler-based systems, the old uh, Doppler DF type systems, work reasonably well for a narrow band FM modulated CW type signal. They don't work at all for wide band or noise-like signals. On the other hand, other systems, for example, like correlative interferometry, work on wide band signals as well because they're only measuring phase differences. So it really depends strongly on the interference type or the type of signal you're looking at. For handhelds, not so much of a difference. For automatic direction finding systems, the type of signal that you're looking for. Uh, one other question. Can you explain why measurement speed is important when looking at bursty signals? Uh, well, as I mentioned before, there's, in my mind, a, a little bit of a misconception about measurement speed. Obviously, if you're looking at a bursty signal, say that you're looking at a frequency hopping signal or a signal of very short duration, uh, if you have an instrument that's not fast enough to see it, then you won't see it, and that obviously is a big problem. So for bursty signals, measurement speed is absolutely critical. And if you're in a military or government or signals intelligence type application where you're trying to pick up signals that don't necessarily want to be picked up, then obviously here you would need an instrument that's fast and has that kind of speed. Now, for bursty signals that are interfering signals, that may be short signals, again, speed is important because you have a limited window in which you can see it, especially if you're in motion. Very few of us have the leisure of sitting in our office and rotating an antenna and finding an interferer. Typically, we have to be out in the field, moving around, often in a vehicle, maybe moving an antenna rapidly, and we'd like a system that responds to that signal as quickly as possible. So this is the other aspect of speed, that you can see short duration signals, but again, that it also will respond quickly to signals that may only be visible for a short period of time, even though in some cases those signals may be continuous wave type signals. Uh, this next question seems to be somewhat related to the last next one. Question? Um, so when you find a signal outside and it happens to be inside a huge building, is there tools or, or processes to find a signal within a huge building? Uh, yes, the, the first the solution is to get inside of the huge building. <laughs> I'm actually very surprised at the number, um, I mean that only half jokingly. 
Um, I'm always surprised at the number of people who will let strange people holding directional antennas and, and equipment walk into their buildings and walk around with them. Uh, I've very rarely been denied entry into a building when I've been doing interference hunting, and usually that was for a good reason. Um, there, if you have an instrument that's sufficiently sensitive and that is uh, sufficiently advanced, often you can actually walk around the building and have a very good idea of where the signal is coming from inside the building. Um, I was recently doing some interference hunting where we had signals coming from a large building. Uh, what, it was a health club. And I could actually walk around the building with my instrument and say it's coming from the top, second floor of the back left corner of this building. Again, using a suitably directional antenna and carefully looking at the levels on my instrument. And sure enough, it was a lighting ballast that was being used in a basketball court in that part of the building. So often you can narrow it down to a certain point in the building, even from outside the building, if you have a sufficiently sensitive instrument. But ultimately, nothing replaces being able to actually access the building and walk around inside of it. And if you're a wireless operator, for example, uh, you typically can use your badge. People know who you are and can access the building and look around. And again, in the worst case scenarios, and sometimes you have to involve the FCC in order to get access to the building. But being able to narrow it down to a certain area of the building is very helpful. It's also very helpful to be able to explain to people who are in charge of that building or maybe limiting access to that building what your needs are. Uh, I often find it very helpful to approach a person and show them exactly what we're doing, spend the time, 10, 15 minutes, to show them what I'm looking for on my instrument. And then actually most of them take an interest in it and will actually go around with you because they're just curious as to how this actually works. So again, the best way is access to the building, although if you have a sufficiently sensitive instrument, you should be able to determine a rough location even from outside of the building. Great. What is the benefit of FFT-based ar architecture? I'm sorry. Well, FFT-based architecture has, has a couple of different benefits. Um, one benefit is speed. That's the biggest benefit. Anyone who's ever seen an FFT and a heterodyne-based instrument play side-by-side -side with identical parameters, um, usually the, the reaction is wow. Because again, FFT is a next-generation architecture, if you will. It's something that's a substantial step up in terms of sophistication from a swept analyzer, and it's much, much faster. Many people have never seen one before are, are frankly amazed at how quickly they operate and how well they work. FFT-based analyzers also have some advantages in terms of immunity to overload, because again, of the architecture, the whole load is not being applied to the front end. And they also tend, in my opinion, and I use both spectrum analyzers and FFT-based analyzers, um, they tend to be easier to use. If you've used a traditional spectrum analyzer, you know that you have issues with what is the correct resolution bandwidth to choose, what is the correct video bandwidth, what is the right sweep time, et cetera, et cetera. An FFT-based architecture doesn't have a sweep time. It doesn't have, strictly speaking, a resolution bandwidth. So in that case, I think that there are two advantages, really, in FFT. Is one is, of course, speed, and that's the big one. But the other one is ease of operation, especially for someone who has not already been using a spectrum analyzer and is coming fresh to this, as so many people are. Uh, next question. All right. For, say, the hobbyists or the non-pro, are there any good interference hunting or mapping smartphone apps out there that you're familiar with? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Could you say the first part of that again? Um, so for, like, a hobbyist or a non-pro, are uh, there any interference hunting mapping smartphone apps? Well, interference hunting mapping by itself, there are plenty of maps where you can map all kinds of things and put all kinds of markers. Uh, for the hobbyist, I'm an amateur radio operator myself. I've been with for 20 years. So um, ultimately, you, the trick is not so much the mapping application because, again, there are lots of free applications for mapping. The trick is having a device that can actually sense the interference and give you a meaningful reading so that you can actually go around and make measurements. What I actually have found that's interesting is I have encountered several people trying to use hobbyist-type devices to do serious interference hunting. And that has never really ended well, that has sufficient horsepower to do it. Now, on the hobbyist side, um, could you do it? Depends on the signal type and what have you. It's not so much the mapping as making sure that you have a receiver that's suitably sensitive and suitably fast for finding the kind of interfere or the kind of signal that you're looking for. Next um, question? Yep, we have uh, another one coming in. Does Rodian Schwartz offer a portable monitoring receiver? Uh, yes, we do. But I would say if you're interested in that, to take that offline or visit our website. We'd be happy to talk about, about that later. Okay. Another one coming in is, what does BDA mean? Uh, BDA, I'm sorry, that's my fault. Uh, BDA is a bidirectional amplifier. Um, you may hear these refer to the FCC, for a reason I'm not completely sure about, very unscientifically refers to them as signal boosters. Uh, if you go to the FCC website, they call them signal boosters. Um, say that you live in an area where you have poor cell phone reception, or you are in a structure, say a concrete building, where you have poor cell phone reception. One way that you can improve your reception is by having a BDA, a bidirectional amplifier. In other words, you have an outside antenna, a donor antenna, 
that picks up the signals from the base station, amplifies them, this is the amplifier part of it, and, and it injects those signals into the building. So your phone actually gets a higher, gets more bars essentially. On the return path, it picks up the uplink signals from your phone, amplifies them, and transmits them back to the base station. Again, usually using a small externally mounted Yagi antenna. And this is the bi-directional part. It amplifies both the signals going in the downlink and the signals going in the uplink. And if these are installed properly, they work very well. As a matter of fact, the wireless network operators will install them. Um, current law allows people also to buy their own, Wilson's, their other brands, and install them themselves. The problem that you have typically with bi-directional amplifiers is when they're installed improperly. If there's insufficient separation between the two antennas, you can have a situation in which the signal oscillates. That picture I showed on one of the slides of the sort of birthday cake looking hump, um, this is a perfect example of an oscillating BDA. And the problem is, of course, once it starts oscillating, it raises the noise floor so high in the uplink that the tower can no longer hear the phones at all anymore. And this is one of the top issues I've seen. I, I Hardly a week goes by where I don't see a malfunctioning BDA. And you will see them in a variety of places. People put them on buildings. People put them on homes. We see them on boats where people think they can improve their cellular coverage by having one on a boat. And unless you have a very large boat, it's hard to get that at the uh, sufficient antenna separation between them. So that's what BDAs are, and um, that is one of the big issues that we see in interference hunting. Okay, great. Well, I think that about does it for time. Uh, I want to thank Paul Denisowski from Rodian and Schwartz. Um, is there any closing comments you want to make before we close this out? No, except that I think that interference hunting, as time goes on, is becoming a more and more important aspect of RF performance engineering and RF engineering in general. And frankly, I think that if you get involved in interference hunting and take the time to learn about the different types of interferers and RF and the instruments and tools, that it actually can be very enjoyable. I think one of the best parts of my job is actually going out and doing interference hunting in the field. All right. Thank you, Paul. And thank you to our attendees. And just a reminder, within 24 hours, we will get an on-demand uh, version of this webinar for you, for your reference. And if you have any questions, just follow up with us. And we thank you for attending. Thank you, everyone.